Okay, to lead our next discussion, <laughs> I'm going to pass the microphone over to the chair of our National Security Affairs Department, uh, Dr. Professor and Professor Derek Riveron. Yeah, great. Uh, good morning, uh, Admiral. Great to see you, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, it's wonderful to uh, introduce a, a friend, a colleague, uh, David Sanger. You have his full bio. You know a couple things. You know to highlight. Uh, right, you, you can read him regularly in the New York Times. He's been covering the White House, can I say, since the Clinton era? Uh, I'm afraid you can. <laughs> it would be true. It may not. <laughs> so he, he's been covering the White House uh, for quite a long time. Uh, and prior to that, certainly the Tokyo bureau chief. Uh, a couple of his books, too, have been translated to documentaries. So we want to encourage you to read. Uh, but, uh, you know, related to this book, uh, Year One, um, which was an HBO documentary, first year of the Biden administration. And so I, as I reread this book, I saw a lot of Year One in it. And then his previous book was Perfect Weapon, uh, about the role of cyberspace operations. So that's also a uh, documentary as well. Um, so what I thought I would do, because he did write this book, the book came out uh, last month, uh, or in mid-April, and so it's good news for all of us. It's, you know, it, it turns out you're a good writer, um, and I, I want to credit uh, his co-author and friend, colleague Mary Brooks, uh, who he shared the byline with, and, and I assume Mary sort of kept you in line, she Did, uh, which, which is good. Um, and so what I thought to do is share some of the book with you, and I offer uh, short questions. I'll ask for short answers so we can get to the audience. So the first question, um, and, and I also did this too for you, because I don't know if you wrote this or Mary wrote this. So this way at least you're, you're hearing it for the first, potentially the first time. So Clinton brought China into the World Trade Organization. Bush made Beijing and Moscow uneasy partners in counterterrorism. Obama struck an arms control with Putin and climate change agreement with Xi. Obama boasted that Russia and China joined the West in negotiating the 2015 nuclear deal with Iran and were episodically helpful in reining in North Korea. Trump finally struck a modest trade deal with Xi in 2020. Each new bond was trumpeted as a major win, as a sign the world's most powerful nations were rowing together. They were not. So my question to you, what went wrong? Well, great question. And thank you, uh, Derek, for uh, being up here. Uh, Derek and I have a long relationship and have taught together at various moments over the past uh, decade or so. So it's a real honor to be back at the Naval War College. And uh, I particularly um, feel the presence of, of my dad, uh, Lieutenant J.G. Uh, Ken Sanger, who passed away two years ago but was the fighter director on a uh, destroyer uh, out in the Pacific. He was at um, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. He did, he, he did that, that whole last, you know, six, eight months of World War II on part of the first occupy, occupying force just outside of, of Nagasaki days after the bomb went off. So um, uh, he would be particularly happy. He would finally think I made it here by, <laughs> That's right. by virtue of the fact that, that, that I'm here. Um, so, um, great question about uh, what went wrong here. And the essence of New Cold Wars, the central argument of it, is that for 30 years, um, we lived in a little bit of a national fantasy that we were going to get Russia and China, each for their own very different reasons, to sign up to Western institutions, Western practices, and that at the end of the day, what would bring them over was their commercial interests, that China needed to keep the markets open to the United States, that Russia needed to keep its oil flowing to Europe, and that while there would be episodic uh, territorial disputes, disputes over other national interests, whether it was Ukraine or Taiwan or whatever, at the end of the day, no rational leader would risk those economic relationships for this greater good. And that turned out to be fundamentally wrong. And the question that comes up out of that paragraph 
is whether or not we were wrong because of faulty intelligence, whether we were wrong because of wishful thinking, there was a lot of that going on, whether we were wrong because we projected our interests on our adversaries and assumed that because we would not go risk our economic relationships, they would not either. And by the way, this is not a political statement I am making here. I was with Bill Clinton, since you've reminded me that I'm, uh, you know, I was once the youngest, one of the youngest reporters in the New York Times. I've now been there 42 years. Um, so uh, uh, you, you reminded me for the Clinton administration, Bill Clinton went to Beijing University and in a speech toward the end of his uh, time in office said, the internet will free China and undercut the Communist Party because once there's that flow of information you will get. We, and you know what? I believed this, Derek, when I was sitting there listening to it. And it was a very common argument at the time and basically unchallenged. And instead, the Communist Party turned out to be extraordinarily good at using what the internet wrought as for exquisite social control. President uh, Bush had 24 meetings with Putin went to China any number of times, was convinced that they were joining the counterterrorism operations. They were for their own purposes, which were to repress Muslim minorities, as were the Russians. Um, President Obama, when uh, the Chinese uh, went into OPM uh, and Office of Personnel Management and took 22.5 million security clearance files, and you know how detailed these are? I, right, I have lifetime uh, coverage now for identity protection. That's right, and I'm pleased to say that. Uh, and I'm sure the Chinese are having a very good time right now reading through your file. But the fact of the matter is, the fact that the government responded to a Chinese attack here to steal this stuff, Chinese theft, by first not naming China or Russia as the attackers at various moments, and then sending you that notice as if what Xi Jinping wanted was your visa card number, when in fact what he was trying to do was understand the relationships among all of those who held security clearances in the United States, their travel records, their vulnerabilities, their health records, every relationship they've ever been in. So this was a real bipartisan fantasy we were engaged in. Yeah, and we'll come back to that, and hopefully some of the questions, too, you'll draw him out more on that. Um, okay. So it's a, it's a bad sign. I'll assure you I did read everything in between as I was compiling sort of my excerpts. I, it seems I've got some early pages, and then I jump all the way to the end. We'll be quizzing you on the middle <laughs> of the book uh, presently. Okay, so you do talk about... Um, you know, risks associated with sort of the future in China and, and certainly from the last panel, I think we all have a good understanding of sort of the challenges related to strategic competition with China. And uh, I want to focus on the third risk. Um, and so you write, uh, the third risk is that through some combination of America's overheated rhetoric and its enthusiasm for new sanctions, America and its allies unintentionally drive China and or Russia and China together Washington already has a severe case of anti-China animus, bordering on unchecked xenophobia. As elections approach, there's no easier political target than the Chinese Communist Party. At the end of 2023, there was talk among some in Congress, the combination of Russia and China, along with Iran, constituted an axis of evil that America needed to deal with. Uh, it was never really made clear what deal with meant exactly. What's missing is that overheated debate is discussion of a real strategy for driving a wedge in the emerging partnership between Beijing and Moscow. That will require a combination of cunning and diplomatic nuance, an updated and improved version of what Kissinger and Nixon pulled off half a century ago by focusing American diplomatic efforts to exploit existing differences and natural tensions between the two nations. So, so my, I'm, I'm glad you brought that one up. Yeah. Um, the other day, as, as um, some news colleagues of mine were uh, preparing for the presidential debate that you'll see at the end of the month, uh, the, I think the first one's a CNN, the CNN-sponsored debate, uh, 
Um, they said to me, if you had one foreign policy question you could go ask the two candidates, what would it be? And I said, that's one simple, and it's, it's pretty straightforward, and it hasn't been discussed one time in the campaign, as far as I can tell, which is, please explain to me your strategy for dividing China from Russia at a moment that we are seeing for the first time uh, since the Nixon-Kissinger opening, a coming together of these two very different countries with very different uh, motivations and very different interests. What is your strategy for doing this? And I think it's actually the central question that all of us need to be thinking about probably for the next 10 or 20 years. Because the biggest single geopolitical change that we have seen in recent times is that China and Russia have managed what at one point, just before the Beijing Olympics, they referred to as a partnership without limits. We have since discovered there are limits. But we've also discovered that China has very rapidly moved to an embrace of Russia that even at the beginning of the um, Biden administration, we did not see coming. Um, Many of you remember Colin Call, who uh, was the number three in the Pentagon until, what, about a year and a half ago? Yeah. yeah. Hoover Institute, now at Stanford. Right. Uh, terrific academic, was in the Obama administration as well. And one day he was doing a on-the-record briefing for us, so I can uh, describe this with a small group of reporters. And this probably would have been... 20, end of 2022, beginning of 2023. And he said, you know, after all this debate inside the administration about whether this coming together of Russia and China is real or whether they will split apart given their natural uh, adversarial tendencies, he said, I'm now convinced it's real. It doesn't mean it's an alliance, but I'm convinced it's a real partnership. And he went on to describe his logic. Um, the next day, President Biden had uh, one of his relatively rare full press conferences. He's actually doing one on Thursday in, in Italy for the G7. I'll be there as well. And at the last question, he called on me. And uh, so I figured, well, we just heard this from Colin. Let's see what the president thinks about it. And I asked him whether he thought this was real. And he went into a somewhat winding answer, which can happen on occasion, but he um, but basically said, no, I don't think so. You know, I don't think these are two countries that can get along. This is now a view that I'm told reliably by his aides, he has revised. That tells you how new this is as a challenge uh, for us. And you see it, Derek, particularly in the Ukraine war responses. The US warned China early on, do not provide arms to the Russians. And they have not. North Korea has. Iran is obviously providing drones, missiles. But in the past six or eight months, we have seen such a flow of dual use technology from China to Russia uh, that the only conclusion you have, can come to is that that combined with their purchases of Russian oil, which have been quite aggressive, they are almost single-handedly rebuilding a somewhat devastated Russian military. Which kind of ties to this next question. Um, so Biden's problem, of course, was that many countries had crossed several of the 16 red lines before and, uh, related to cyber, uh, including Russia, Iran, North Korea. These actors had put malicious code in the American electric grid. They had interfered with the financial markets and famously a major movie studio. They had frozen schools and universities and hospitals with ransomware campaigns. They had launched influence operations targeting the integrity of the electoral process. Uh, Biden had to convince Putin there was a new sheriff in town and the price of these attacks going forward would be far more severe. 
He would not make excuses for Putin's actions as Trump had. He would not hesitate to name the Russians as bad actors as Obama had. So as we think about cyber, and I think uh, Emily Goldman was probably going to talk a little bit about that later uh, during the conference. Um, so talk a little bit about like, the, how cyber impacts how we think about national security. That the monopoly, like if we take the nuclear question, right, the monopoly is really still held within governments. But when we talk about the cyber challenge, oftentimes the early warning is not coming from the U.S. intelligence community. And then maybe tie that a little bit into sort of the semiconductor challenge, and, and maybe there's an analog with the discussion earlier about shipbuilding. Great. Um, well, let's, um, well, first of all, the question comes from somebody who has literally um, written the book on how we uh, should be dealing with these cyber challenges. So if you haven't read uh, Derek's terrific book on this, uh, we were basically, he was working on that while I was working on The Perfect Weapon. So uh, you so made we, me feel behind, we, right, we, we trying to catch up. We, uh, we, we spent a lot of time discussing this. So the, the paragraph you read in the book referred to the one summit meeting that President Biden had with Vladimir Putin, and it was three years ago next week. Uh, it was in Geneva. And uh, it was obviously months before the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Ukraine came up briefly at the summit, but not in any detail. And what that summit was really about was um, about ransomware coming out of Russia. Uh, you may remember that the uh, colonial pipeline uh, attack had just happened. Um, it ended up shutting down, or the company ended up shutting down on, in, in their panic. Uh, the flow of uh, jet fuel and gasoline up and down uh, the East Coast. And I remember in the midst of it, I was down giving a talk at Fort Bragg, or what used to be called Fort Bragg, and um, uh, there were lines almost out to the gate for gasoline at a time of no scarcity of real supply around the country, but it just showed you how one ransomware attack, which we don't think was actually directed out of the Kremlin, but was Russian actors, basically touched off up and down the East Coast a crisis like this. And that really got the president's attention because when you saw those lines, suddenly this had an impact on ordinary life. So he had his one meeting with Putin and I would venture a guess here, call me on this in, in a few years, but no matter how the election turns out in November, whether Biden is reelected or not, there will still be only one meeting between Putin and, and, and Biden. Um, as I said before, President Bush had 24 or 25, so that and gives you a- I think Putin a, and she, it's in the 40s. I just hit 50. 50. Yeah, yeah. So um, gives you a little bit of a sense of, of the degree of interaction. And the president's warning to Putin at that time was, if an attack comes up out of your territory, we will hold you responsible for it. Um, I actually don't think we've done terribly well on that pledge. Uh, ransomware is more rampant today than it was when that meeting took place three years ago, uh, and including from, from Russia. Um, that said, it would be easy to come to the conclusion that uh, we are not, we have not seen in, in the Ukraine war a lot of cyber activity, and that would be wrong. Um, the uh, early warning was that uh, Viasat, the European satellite network, was attacked the week before the war started by the Russians without ever touching their assets in space. They did it with a cyber attack on the modems on the ground, a vulnerability we had not thought very much about. Um, Microsoft uh, provided much of the early warning that uh, cyber attacks were beginning to happen in the 24 hours before the war broke out. And in the beginning of the book, you'll see an account first from the State Department and the Pentagon about the warnings they were seeing, then from inside the Microsoft Center near Dulles Airport, where their warnings went up to the Microsoft leadership over to Ann Neuberger at the White House, the na uh, Deputy National Security Advisor for Cyber, uh, who then went into Jake Sullivan, and that was an important. There's a line in the book from General Milley, 
Um, I'll, I'll clean up the language for a nice uh, conference here at the he, Naval he's War College. He's a Naval War College graduate. Well, there you go. Um, and um, uh, he um, made the point, he said, when the war started, he said, we thought it was gonna be a nice, clean cyber war. Then he said, we thought it was going to be a World War II style tank war. He said, and then it became a blanking uh, trench warfare, World War I style war. And in fact, when he went into his office, uh, when he was still chairman, he kept two pictures up of soldiers covered in mud and he made you stand there and figure out which one was World War I and which one was taken in Ukraine. And only from the differences in the helmets and uniforms could you figure it out. So we have now seen that transition to cyber that you and I have talked about for so many years, where it is now integrated with the rest of warfare. Um, I always thought it was ridiculous to think we would have separate cyber wars, just as we, it was ridiculous to think in 1914 we would have separate air wars. It just took time to integrate it. And I, I think that sort of pulls a lot of this together. Um, and so everything we've talked about, these are, these are the contours of the new cold wars, note the plural, a combustible mix of simultaneous high stakes conflicts nested inside each other. They form the foundations of an era that will almost certainly outlive the current septuagenarian and octogenarian leaders of China, Russia, and the United States, and may indeed prove a near permanent condition for the next several decades. So as you think about, so maybe the first question, because we were talking about this last night, um, you know, so it's new Cold Wars, plural, and then even Cold War conjured up, well, what year is it? And everybody has different version of what year it is as we think through the future. You know, if it's 1914, if it's the 1930s, if it's 1947, what, you know, as you think about, so first, why pluralize it? Um, and then second, you know, the optimistic parts of the Cold War, detente, thaw, or, or the most hair-raising, you know, red dawn, um, you know, uh, parts of the Cold War. Well, it's plural for the reason that we started with, which is we have more than one adversary here. The old Cold War had a certain simplicity to it. It was primarily a military conflict. Within that, it was primarily a nuclear conflict. It was with one major adversary. We understood who had launch authority in the nuclear realm. We each had a red phone on somebody's desk. You had a pretty good idea who would answer it. And a relatively high confidence level that it actually would get answered. All of that is gone now. In the new Cold Wars, because you have two major players and then some side players along the way, um, you have a dynamic that is much more unstable. None of the predictability that the Cold War settled into after the Cuban Missile Crisis scared the hell out of us, right? Um, so that's number one. Uh, number two is um, that within that, the dynamic between Russia and China is going to drive many of our decision makings. I, uh, Julian Barnes, our intelligence reporter, and I wrote a piece last week when the administration finally said in public what they have said to us for months in private, which is New START, the last nuclear treaty is going to obviously expire in February of 2026. I think uh, anybody here who wants to bet that we'll uh, negotiate a, um, uh, a successor to New Start, I'm, I'm putting money down out in the, in the hallway out in the back during the break. Uh, I think chances that we will negotiate a new one are about zero. And then we're going to have to make some very fundamental decisions. Do we, as some Republicans in Congress have argued, and certainly as the defense industrial base has argued, have to go match a combined Russia-China force? I, I don't think so. Do we have what we need now to deal with the possibility that they could use this force at least diplomatically in concert or threaten to? Yeah, we're gonna have to rethink that. And the Biden administration is actually publicly the other day acknowledge that, and I think you saw Jake Sullivan get asked about that on um, Face the Nation on Sunday. Um, what that number is, I don't know. 
But it is clear to me that if this is the operating environment we're in the, for the next 20 or 30 years, then we're going to have, it's going to drive a whole series of decisions. It's going to drive the decisions about how big a fleet to have out and how much we invest in that base. It's going to drive the decisions about semiconductors, a very pa um, parallel issue to what's happened with uh, the, uh, the maritime base. In the semiconductor arena, we also gave up manufacturing, thinking we can just design the chips in the US, we'll have a reliable supply chain, and the supply chain center is Taiwan Semiconductor, which is this remarkable company, most highly capitalized company in Asia, sitting basically on sites in Taiwan, 100 miles off the coast of our biggest adversary for all the reasons we just discussed. And so for the book, in my reporting on this, and this is a reported narrative book, I spent some time in Taiwan talking to the chairman and others of Taiwan Semiconductor about whether there is a silicon shield. In other words, do we think that Taiwan Semiconductor is so valuable to China that it would never risk attacking Taiwan? Or do we think that as, Ta as China builds up its own semiconductor um, ability, which President Biden has, I think, rightly gone to try to interfere with by restricting the uh, export of not only high-end semiconductors, but the equipment to build them, um, does China think, well, this is a diminishing asset for the Taiwanese. And basically where I come out in the book is, at the moment that Taiwan Semiconductor is not the most vital supplier for China, is the moment at which Taiwan is probably most vulnerable. And it, you know, it's instructive, because if you right, talk a little bit about the story of TSMC, the, the original idea uh, was for him to build it in the United States. And the founder happen. of TSMC tried to sell his idea to his employer at the time, Texas Instruments, which um, told him to go take the whole idea and stuff it. And he was immediately recruited by the Taiwanese, who at the time had almost no presence in the semiconductor business. The last two lines of this. Yeah, so so yeah. I thought to conclude, to, so you don't have to buy the book. Um, <laughs> Thanks, is, Derek. Is, I, I, I want to end on a, on a happier note. And so I'm going to ask David, so this way you can uh, at least share the experience you got to read in Spruance Auditorium at the Naval War College. That's so. right. That's right. Um, for all the present risks, it's worth remembering that one of the most remarkable and little discussed accomplishments of the old Cold War was that the great powers never escalated their differences into direct conflict. That is an eight-decade-long streak we cannot afford to break. <laughs>